I'm, I'm up here for just one moment, and because I don't want to interrupt the flow of the evening, and Steve and Misty are going to lead us in a time of worship right now, and, um, and then Elise is going to come up and, and teach us. But um, I just want to say just a little bit about Elise and how much I appreciate her ministry, how much I appreciate our mutual friend Donna Davenport for introducing me to Elise, and uh, you know, we pastor's wives. Um, I don't let just anybody stand up here. I mean, I know they're popular speakers, and I know there are a lot of ladies that can draw a crowd, but I'm really concerned about the message that they bring, and uh, we're not here to play around or mess around, though we do have fun, but I want somebody who will deliver the goods, something that when I walk out that door, uh, it's going to help me, and it's going to, I'm going to be able to stand and hold on to it, and the reason we can is because Elise brings a message that is really focused on the Word of God, this isn't just... 10 easy tips to having a happier life or something. So um, we'll go to the Elks Club or the whatever club for that. But uh, when we come to church, we want to hear from God's word. Amen? <laughs> and uh, I don't, I, we'll never bring you anything but that from this pl- uh, platform, as long as um, Greg and I have anything to say about it. But um, I just want to say Elise has three kids, right? And, and more importantly, six grandchildren. And uh, her daughter, Jessica, is actually here this evening, and she's got her granddaughter, Alexandra. They call Allie, and uh, it's a lovely name. But anyway, go say hi to them. She has a book table. She's written over, over 15 books, from what I understand, and uh, she's brought all of them with her tonight. I believe there's, they're all available back there, and I can highly recommend any of them, any one of them. And, uh, and I know that she'll tell you a little bit about um, the proceeds of the sales of this book go to a good cause. And uh, so anyway, I just am so thankful for her. And um, let's see, I uh, think that's about all I want to say. I just love you, Elise, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your message again. I'm thankful to be with you here again this year. I think this is the fourth time I've been with, uh, with you, with Kathy and the wonderful team here. It's I count it a privilege to count you uh, as among those who I would call my friends, and so thank you. Um, I do want to say that we do have a book table in the back, and let me just get this just right out there. You can buy these books more cheaply on Amazon. Okay? (laughs) So if you take your handy-dandy iPhone scanner... Um, You can. um, I can't sell them as cheaply as Amazon can. I don't know why. I don't know how they stay in business, but they do. Um, Unless it's a gigantic Ponzi scheme, and eventually it'll all die. I don't know. But anyway, um, the reason we run a book table is that uh, our youngest son, Joel, is in seminary. He's, um, He's... going to get a master's in divinity at Westminster Seminary. He would like to be a pastor. And uh, so what our family has done is made a commitment to try to help him do that so that once he gets out of seminary, he doesn't end up owing $80,000 and try to figure out how he's going to pay off his student loans uh, on a pastor's salary. So that's why we have the books. And uh, Jessica will be back there. And if you have any questions or anything, I think I'm going to be back there signing as well if if that's something interesting to you. And my children think that's hysterical. And so whenever I, whenever I have another book that comes out, they always come up to me and go, Oh, Mom, will you sign my book? And, and one time Joel said, Mom, if you're so famous, why aren't we rich? So I said, I don't know, and I will sign your book, though. So, And I'll slap you because you're not too big for me to do that. Um, just kidding. Don't slap my kids. Um, <laughs> I want to talk to you tonight about worry and give you Christ's word to worriers. So my question for you tonight is, um, how many of you worry? Good. That's, yes, good. Some of you are double. Two hands up. <laughs> and it's good. <laughs> um, Yeah. Uh, We all worry, don't we? And uh, at certain times of our life, we worry about different sorts of things. Um, When we're 
teenage girls and young women. We worry about whether or not we're ever going to be able to find a husband and get married. And then, you know, if the Lord happens to bring somebody into our life, we wonder how on earth we're going to stay married forever, you know. And uh, if, I, if we're going to have kids and what they're like and, you know, I... I the reality about worry is that there isn't a season in your life where you get through the rough patch of worry. All right? We never get through it. We all have times, uh, we all have things in our lives which, uh, which can uh, uh, cause us, can cause us to worry. So if you don't hear anything else that I say tonight, the one thing I really want you to hear is this. Your heavenly Father knows. Your heavenly Father knows. He knows what you need. He knows what you need to hear. He knows what you need to have. He knows. Your heavenly Father knows. Now, I'm going to talk to you tonight from Matthew 6, but, but I, I just want to set this up for you. I am not a person who is, ha, has this wired. I am, I am not perfect in my faith by any stretch of the imagination. And like many of you, I can wake up in the middle of the night, and part of that has to do with the whole age that I am and this really bizarre menopausal thing that's like, a, <laughs> really? You know? <laughs> um, and, and the women who are laughing right now are women who are my age, and they understand exactly what I'm talking about when you go to bed and everything is fine and then you wake up at 2.30 in the morning and you're absolutely drenched and you, when you wake up you go, ah! like that. And then you just worry for like two and a half hours. <laughs> I keep waiting for it to be over. I know eventually it will end. Or not. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not perfect at this, okay? I'm just going to tell you. I know... I know what the Lord has to say about it, and that's what I want to say to you. I know how to encourage you. Uh, I know the things that if you take notes and you keep them by your bed, if that's where you worry or wherever it is that you happen to worry, if you keep these things close to you, uh, the Lord will help you. If you pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give you grace and strength, he will do that, but I'm not coming to you as Mrs. Perfect, never worry. Okay? I, personally, was up at about 2 o'clock last night and had to get up at 5 this morning to come here. So, um, and, then, and then part of what you do when you're, when you're worrying is you worry about the fact that you're worrying so much. Right? <laughs> Did you ever do that? It's like, oh, pfft, I got to go talk about worry and I can't even get it through the night. I can't get through the night. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm just like you. But I have a Savior who is so gracious and will, and will help us. We don't really need to define worry, do we? We don't need to define it. You all know what it is. Now, it's, what's really interesting is in the Bible, when the Bible uses the word anxiety or anxiousness or worry, it can be translated worry, it's actually a word that means to be distracted and pulled in all kinds of different directions. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that what your brain is doing when you are worrying, what your mind is doing? It's like you think about, oh, well, what happens, what would happen if this and this, and then, but if that happens, then what would happen? And then, and you know that whole little rabbit trail thing that you can go down so easily, and particularly, I think, at night. You know, it's, it's a very good thing to not believe anything that you think at night. <laughs> <laughs> believe what you think during the day, right? Because I wake up then, when I ever finally go to sleep, and then in the daylight, there are things, and I think, well, that's ridiculous. Why, was I, why would I even think about that? Uh, my friend, actually, who's a wonderful writer, a godly woman, she works for Crossway Publishing, named Lydia Brownback. She, she made a very interesting point one time. She said, the reason that you think like that at night is because that's where your thoughts actually would go if you, if you couldn't sort of distract yourself with all the ways you think you're going to control everything. I thought that was really good. 
See, during the day, I can, yes, I can embrace truth, but I can also think about all the things I'm going to do to make things better, whereas at night, I can't call anybody, although I can email at 2 o'clock in the morning. If you get an email from me at 2 o'clock in the morning, and you're awake, I'm sorry, and <laughs> send an email back and say, stop worrying, go to sleep. So we know what it means to worry. It means to have this distraction. It's very interesting. We're going to look at this passage in Matthew 6 where Jesus talks about worry, but he tells you how to, how to focus your mind, what to do with your mind when you are tempted to worry. So uh, what I want to do with you, though, is I want to talk to you just for a moment. The most, most of our time this evening, we're going to be talking about what does the gospel declare, gospel declarations. What does the gospel declare about who you are and who Christ is and what he has done? And I'm going to talk mostly there. And then I'll talk in maybe the last five minutes or so of our time about what you're then obligated to do in light of, in light of what he's already done. And, and, I, and I put on your paper there, gospel-centered counseling. And what I mean by that is how do you talk to yourself? How do you talk to yourself? Listen, you can listen to Oprah or Dr. Phil or Dr. anybody, whoever happens to be the doctor du jour, uh, on the radio today or on television, and they will have 42 steps for overcoming anxiety. And uh, I, what I would like to do is encourage you to listen to what the Savior has already done for you, what he says about you, what he says about his relationship with you, and and not concentrate so much on those 42 things that you need to do in order to be in order to free yourself from anxiety but rather focus in more narrowly on what Christ has already done for you and what that means about who you are so i'm going to start reading and rather than starting there in Matthew 6:25 i'm going to start uh, in verse 19 because here is Jesus who is talking about worry and it's interesting because you know you've got Jesus and he's and he's giving the sermon on the mountain so what that means is he's sitting at the top of a hill and he's talking to people who are spread out on the grass listening to him and so he's what he's going to do before he begins to talk to them about their worry and about faith what he's going to do, first of all, is he's going, to, he's going to be a good soul physician. He's going to diagnose what their problem is. And so what he does in verse 19 is he says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now here's Jesus, and he's the sole physician. And he's going to talk to his people about their problem with anxiety. He doesn't start off by saying, okay, don't worry. What he starts off doing to begin with is he tells them why they worry. Do you want to know why you worry? You don't worry because your mother was a worrier. Now, she may have been a worrier, but that's not the primary reason you worry. Jesus doesn't say, go back and see how much of a worrier your mother was. What he says is, wherever your heart, wherever your treasure is, that is what you're going to worry about. And if you have treasure here on earth, if you have treasure here on earth, then you're going to worry, and the reason is that here on earth, there are moths and rust and thieves. Do you see? Everything that you hold here Maybe 
lost to you. Everything. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that this whole earth, what's going to happen to it? It's all going to burn. Everything will burn, and God will recreate a new heavens and a new earth. So everything here, whether it is just a car that I like, and particularly if you live near the ocean, or if you live in the Midwest where they have loads and loads of snow and salt on the roads, there's rust. Everything we own is in the process of decay. Everything, every relationship you have, which may be growing, but eventually, every relationship we have, except our relationship with God, is going to end in some way, right? I've been married for almost 40 years. And eventually, one of us is going to leave. Right? I mean, that's just the reality. It is the reality of life in this world. Life in this world is moths and thieves and rust. And if it isn't just the general decay of life here or a tsunami that comes in and wipes out 150,000 people or cancer that is eating at you, then there are also people who sin against you, right? I mean, we all lock our doors because there are thieves and they might break in. You see, if I have treasure here, then I'm going to be anxious. Now, here's, here's the diagnostic question that Jesus pushes us to. The question is, what do you worry about? What are you anxious about? What he's saying is, whatever that is that you worry about, that's your treasure. And you have to worry about it if it isn't treasure in heaven. See, he's the treasure of heaven. His kingdom, his righteousness, he's going to go on and talk about. His kingdom, his righteousness. Everything else that's here, this treasure, is liable to be lost. Many of us like being in control. Yes? I mean, have you ever said something like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just a control freak? <laughs> or, I'm really a perfectionist. It would be good to repent. <laughs> <laughs> See, the reason that a lot of people are afraid to fly in airplanes, and I travel probably 20 weekends a year, so I'm on airplanes a lot. And the reason that I feel better on a, in my car than I do on an airplane is because in my car I think I'm in charge, right? I think I'm in control. It's actually safer for me to be in an airplane than it is for me to be on a car, per, in, in a car, particularly in Southern California, which is where I live. So it's safer for me to be flying, but I don't like those bumps, do you? Do you know why? because I'm not in control of the bumps, and I would like to be the person in control. You worry because you have treasure here, and you want to be in control of it, and when push comes to shove, you know you're not. That's why you worry. Thankfully, Jesus doesn't leave us there. That's the good news. The good news is your Savior doesn't just say, well, your problem is that you have wrong worship. You have treasures that you shouldn't have. And if your treasure was where, it was where it should be, if your heart was where it should be, you would never worry. So change treasures. He doesn't do that. What he does instead is he goes then through a, a talk that will help them learn about trust. In verse 25, he says, Therefore I tell you, and here's the command, 
Do not be anxious about your life. That's the command. And what that means is that when you're anxious about your life, you're sinning, right? Yes? You know, sometimes we, we look at certain kinds of sin and we say, oh, it's just worry, it's no big deal. It's really interesting that Jesus talks about worry as much as he does. He talks about it all over the Gospels. It's very, and as does Paul, as does Peter. They're all talking about worry, you see, because worry is a symptom. It's a fruit, if you will. Worry is just a fruit of something that's going on in your heart. And Jesus is going to get right after that right now. So he says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. And those are the kinds of things that they would have been concerned about. Where's my next meal coming from? And there they are out in the middle of nowhere where there are no ATMs and no Chick-fil-A's on the corner. And he says, don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink. Now, for him to say that to them was a lot more stark than for me to say it to you. Because you can go out in that lobby and get a drink of water. And I, I don't care how poor you are, you can always get food here in this culture. Jesus says, don't worry. Don't worry about what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Listen, he says, you know these things you're worried about, all this earthly treasure that you want to put your trust in, that, that you want to use to make you feel good, to make you feel loved, to make you feel accepted, to make you feel secure, all of those things, all those things you're putting your trust in, really you're missing the real game of what's going on here. You're missing the reality. Your life is more than all of these things, all these ancillary things. And now here's Jesus, and he's using nature as his flannel graph. He's sitting there on a hill, and he says, look at the birds. There they go by, right? Look at the birds. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. See, the birds don't work to get God to give them something. But God cares for them. And Jesus says the most lovely, lovely sentence here. Are you not of more value than they? Listen, he's arguing from the lesser birds, sparrows, that are, by the way, sold for a penny. Those things... God cares for those things that really aren't worth much. Won't he also care for you, you who are worth much more to him? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? I want you to think about all the hours you have spent worrying. Have they, has your worry changed anything? Has it made you able to live longer or be more secure or even be happier? See, Jesus is just being a pragmatist here and he's saying your worry doesn't accomplish anything. It's worthless. See, what you're doing with your, when you're worrying is you're God playing. You are saying to yourself in your own heart, and it's not just you, please understand, I told you, I was up at two in the morning, okay? That somehow, 
if I can just think through this problem enough and turn it over enough times and spin it that direction and think about it enough, if I could just think about this problem enough, then I would be able to solve it and nothing bad would happen to me. Is that what we do with worry? See, Jesus says, all this God playing you're doing, see, God is ruling sovereignly and we're going to get to that. Your idea that you're going to be able to control the universe by the thought, by your thoughts, all of that is absolutely worthless. That's what he's saying. You can't even add one hour to your life. Not even one. Of all of those hours and hours and hours that we spend worrying. And why are you anxious about clothing? So you have this closet that runs like from there to there. Right? And you stand in front of it and you go, I don't have anything to wear. <laughs> what am I going to wear? Did you ever do that? See, Jesus is saying, why are you anxious about clothing? Now, obviously, they didn't have what we have. But just because you have a little amount or a big amount, can I tell you that you can have entire rooms full of clothes and still wonder what you're going to wear and worry about it? It doesn't matter how much you have, right? It doesn't matter how much you have because you might get something and then that'll satisfy you for a couple of days and then it's always something more, isn't it? So, which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Now, they were anxious about clothing in a way we are generally not. They were anxious about clothing because they usually just had one or two pieces of it. And they would be cold. And again, he's going to, here's Jesus, Sermon on the Mount sitting among the grass, out in nature, and he says, now look at the lilies of the field. Look at them. They neither toil nor spin. And yet Solomon, in all of his glory, didn't look like that. If God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven... See, here's birds, which are sold for a penny, not really worth much. Grass of the field, alive today, tomorrow burns up, gone. That's the lesser. He's arguing again from the lesser to the greater. If he would clothe the grass of the field like that, don't you think he could care for you? See, these are the thoughts that we need to remember. Don't you think that the one who could design an air plant, I mean, go figure. I've seen these things around. I thought they were fake. <laughs> Didn't you? Like, I thought they were plastic. I thought, look at that. They put a plastic little plant in there. They're not. They're real. They're so cool. Listen, if God can design this and give it life, don't you think he can care for you? I love those little things. Those are very cool. If God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Hearing Jesus, he's got it. He's going to take care of it. And then he tells you what your problem is. What does he say? Oh, you of what? Little faith. Little faith. See, that's our problem. My problem is I have loads and loads of faith in my own ability to work things out and figure things out. And if I just think about it long enough and turn it around long enough, then eventually I'm going to come up with the right solution. So I have too much faith in myself and not enough faith in God. Therefore, 
Do not be anxious, saying, oh, what are we going to eat or what are we going to drink? I don't know what I'm going to wear. Don't do that. Because when you do, you're acting like an unbeliever. You're acting like an orphan. That's what he's saying here. You're acting like an orphan, like someone who doesn't have a heavenly father who is watching over you, caring for you, providing for you, protecting you, pardoning you. You're acting like an orphan without a father. That's how you're acting. So he says, the Gentiles seek after all these things. They have to. They don't have a father. And your heavenly father, here we are, knows that you need them all. Um, how much does God know? Does he know what you need? Does he really? Do you believe that he knows what you need? That's what you need to know. We went through a time recently, and, you know, I'll confess my sin. Um, we, were, we were in process for moving from one house to another, and the Lord had set up this whole thing. I, um, and, and I'm not going to take the time to go into the whole thing, but the Lord, uh, just out of the blue, brings us a buyer for our house almost really before we had listed it. Uh, we sell our house, and the whole time this is going on, and like from the, from the beginning of March till May 1st, um, we went through about two months of, well, what are we, where are we going to live, and how are we going to do it? That whole thing. And, and at night, when I would wake up, and I mean, I'm wondering, um, well, so are, are, are we actually, are they actually going to buy the house? Are they going to buy it? I mean, are they really going to buy it? I mean, what if, what are, what, what's going to happen? What if they see something and they change their mind? And then, and then we've done all this other stuff, and, right? That, and, and then they actually do buy it. And then I think, well, what are we going to, how are we going to qualify for a loan? I mean, my husband only works part time and, and I'm, I'm, you know, self-employed. And are we going to actually be able to qualify for a loan? Are we going to, is that going to be able to? To happen and you know and then I'm worrying and then we qualify for a loan and then I, I don't know you know if you know what's going on in certain areas but uh, the housing market there are very few houses that you can buy that aren't like in foreclosure and it's a two two year process to buy something so then it's well then are we going to find a house I mean you know yes you sold our house and yes we prayed about it all the whole time and yes you we qualified for this loan I don't know how we did that but we did and we qualified for a loan and but now are we going to have are we going to have a house well, what if we have to live in comfort suites for a couple of months? Okay, and now, my hair was falling out, okay? I'm just, you know, I'll just be honest. And all night long, I just kept saying to myself, I know you're sovereign and I know you love me. I know you're sovereign and I know you love me. That, right? Just right there. My hair is growing back, though, now. It's, got, it's there, these little hairs. I just love them. I, I, I sing to them. <laughs> you know, I'm just like the children in, um, in the wilderness. You know, oh, yeah, well, you know, there's a whole Red Sea thing, and you did, you know, you did drown the Egyptians behind us. And, yeah, yeah, you did, you did bring us out of Egypt. And, yes, you did get us across the Red Sea. And, yes, you did kill our enemies. And, and yes, yes, you know, you are bringing this bread, whatever, to the bread. But, you know, uh, it's okay. You're, you are giving us bread. But, I mean, are you going to give us water? Same thing, right? You know, same deal, same heart, just like them. For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Here is what you need to hear. You have a heavenly Father, and I don't care what your relationship was with your earthly dad. I had practically none with mine. Just because you had a lousy earthly father, don't voice that upon him. 
He's a wonderful father. And you can, by faith, learn what it's like to have a father like that. That's what faith will do. You have a father who knows what you need. Now, what you need to do is seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Here's Jesus again. Listen, seek first God's kingdom, not your own. <laughs> right? See, we get in trouble when we seek our own kingdom. So I want to, like, be in control and have all my minions doing everything I want them to do and not have any problem with anything, and the bank account needs to look like this, and the house needs to look like this, and the children need to look like this, and see, I've got this whole kingdom thing going on. Because I think I'm the queen. <laughs> and I only don't think I'm the king because I'm a girl. <laughs> if I could be a boy and be the king, well, you know, you get it. So I'm, I'm the queen mother. See, whenever I'm focused in on my own kingdom, I'm going to worry. Right? That's when we worry. When we're focused in on our own kingdom and whether or not it's progressing along the way we want it to. And then, Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. See, what I want to do is get to the end of the day and look back on the day and say, aren't I good? Do you ever want to do that? Get to the end of the day and you know you had your list and so you go, ah, oh, I made it all the way through all my list. I'm so good. <laughs> but if you don't make it through your list, then what are you going to do? You're going to worry. Well, I, I, oh, I, should, I, I needed to do that. I, See, Jesus is saying, get rid of the thought that you have any righteousness of your own. Get rid of it. And trust in his righteousness alone. So you get to the end of the day and you say, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. It's not about my kingdom. It's not about my righteousness, my progress, how well I'm doing, whether or not I did the list, whether or not I was nice to the barista, all of that business. It's not about that. It's about his righteousness that he has given to me as a gift, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. So then, I am not to seek my own kingdom or my own righteousness, everything you need will be added to you. There's a difference, of course, between what you want and what you need, right? Everything you truly need will be given to you. And then here's Jesus again, being pragmatic, really. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. How many times have you worried about tomorrow? Here's the reality. You may not make it to tomorrow. Right? I'm 61. I may not make it till tomorrow. When you're young, you think you're always going to make it till tomorrow. I may not make it till tomorrow. Jesus said, don't worry about something that's not here yet. Because when you do, you're neglecting what you need to do today. And that's the problem with worry. You see, it distracts you into all sorts of different way areas so that you're not being faithful in what you need to do today because you're spending all your energy on what might happen tomorrow. <clears throat> Martin Luther said, there were only two days for him. There was today... This day, the day that I have to be faithful to what God has called me to do, there is this day and that day. And those are the only two days he ever dealt with. Now, Luther was under 
the sentence of capital punishment. You understand that. If he had gone certain places in Germany, he would have been executed. There was a time in Luther's life that he had to hide out in this castle, which, by the way, while he's hiding out in the castle, he's translating the New Testament into German. So God is using this really terrible time in Martin Luther's life to accomplish a great good for his people. That's kind of nice, isn't it? See, what feels like a really terrible thing to us can actually turn out to be a really wonderful thing to loads and loads of people that we don't even know. So for Luther, it wasn't just simply, oh, well, no big deal. I'll just skip through life today and then see what happens tomorrow. No, he lived under the sentence of death, as did Paul, as did Peter, as did your Christ. And for all of them, there was today, this is the day I need to be faithful, and then there's that day. And the older I get, it's like walking by a bakery and you can smell the bread baking. The closer I get, the older I get, the closer I get to heaven, and I can smell the bread baking. Do you know what I mean? It's like, oh yeah, there's going to come a day and I'm not going to have to mess around with this stupid sin-riddled body anymore. It'll be so wonderful. No more tears No more crying, no more staying up until 2 o'clock in the morning worrying, never again, completely gone. Everything, everything that I have ever wanted in my entire life, every good desire, completely, utterly satisfied. And the face I have longed to see my entire life, I will see that day. One day. Yes? So then... We live in the light of that. We have today, let's be faithful today. We have that day. We don't know if we have any other day, right? No other day. We may have tomorrow, we may not. See, I worry about what's going to happen when Phil is 66 and then I'm 64 and then die, you know, and then what will happen and how will we pay and today and I need a car, and you, you, Right? cuckoo you know (laughs) so two days that's all there's you have enough you listen to Jesus once again sufficient for the day is its own trouble here's the reality you got enough problems being faithful today don't try to figure out how you're going to work it out tomorrow right Okay, so here we go. You are of more value than the birds of the, than the birds that your heavenly Father cares for. You are of value to your heavenly Father. God cares more for you than He does for the grass of the field, which is clothed beautifully by Him. Your heavenly Father knows what you need. How can he know what you need? Because he knows you. And he just doesn't know this outward persona that you present to people. He knows your heart and soul. He knows what you need. He not only knows what you need, but he is both willing and able to provide for you. Now, again, I am not saying to you that he is willing and able to give you everything you want. And there are all sorts of things that we want that if you look back 10 years later on what you were wanting then, you say, boy, was that ridiculous, right? And thank you, God, for saving me from that. I cried because I didn't get it then, but I'm glad you didn't give it to me. Everything that you truly need will be given to you. Here is a wonderful, wonderful uh, answer from the Heidelberg Catechism. Just talking about how to trust God. I trust him so much that I do not doubt that he will provide whatever I need for body and soul. And he will turn to my good 
whatever adversity he sends me in this sad world. You know, we live in Southern California, ladies. And it's, sometimes it's kind of hard to remember this is actually a sad world. We sort of have believed what we've been told. Like, the world ought to be loads and loads of fun. I grew up here. I understand the vibe in Southern California. I actually love it. But it lies to us. And it tells us that life should be something other than suffering. Listen, if life for the Son of God was suffering, what makes you think it shouldn't be for you too? Not all the time suffering, not morose, not chasing after suffering, but, and there are great joys that God gives us, but this is a sad world. He is able to do this because he is almighty God and he desires to do this because he's a faithful father. Well, now how can I be assured how can I be really assured of God's love for me? You know, because I'm standing up here telling you tonight, you have a loving Heavenly Father, and in your heart you may be wondering, well, how can I tell? How do I know that? Here is the answer. Think about the incarnation. Do you know what I mean when I say incarnation? That, that's what we celebrate at Christmas. When the second person of the Godhead, who always existed as a spirit in perfect communion and light and love and joy with his Father and the Spirit and all the angelic hosts, that person, God the Son, came to earth to be clothed, to take to himself a body just like you and I. I. There is no way in the world that I can even, I'm trying to write on this concept. There aren't words to describe what God has done for us by sending his son in the likeness, Paul says, of sinful flesh and for sin. He sends his son to be one of us, like us. And the amazing thing is, you know, sometimes when we look at that little baby in the manger, we think, oh, well, that's really nice. God came down. God became a man. But he really was only a man for those 33 years. And then he went back to heaven and everything changed. Back to how it was. It never changed. It never will. He is now, as the God-man, representing you in heaven, before his father. See, what he did for you, he did for all eternity. You want to know whether or not you can trust God to provide for you? Think about God the Son becoming Jesus Christ. And not only was he incarnate, not only did he get tired, he perspired, he had to eat, his feet hurt when he stood all day long in the carpenter's shop. Not only did he do all of that, not only did he have to learn how to speak language and put up with brothers and sisters and disciples who were just so amazingly clueless, not only did he do all of that, the entire time he lived, he was living perfectly in your place. Listen, he went through his entire life and never worried once. <clears throat> and that's the record you have before God if you have believed. See, when God looks at you, he doesn't say, oh, there's Kathy the worrier. He says, there's Kathy who is perfect in my sight. Isn't that marvelous? That's good news. Isn't that good news? So he lived this sinless life, and then he suffered a substitutionary death on your behalf. So on your behalf, he goes to the cross, not because he's done anything wrong or worthy of death, 
but because you have. And all of the Father's wrath for all of the sin that you have ever committed or ever will commit, because you remember his death was in the past and everything he forgave was all future. All of God's wrath for all your sin was placed on his beautiful head. And God the Son, who had always lived in this perfect fellowship and communion with his Father then, at that moment, on that day, cried out, My God, my God, why at this moment have you forsaken me? And then he says, It's finished. Do you know why he did that? So that you, in the middle of the night, or whenever it is that you're worrying, can know for certain that God has not forsaken you because he's gotten tired of you, or tired of your sin, or tired of your worry. He's not grown weary of you because he placed all his anger on his son in your place. And then he turned his back on him. And then, he dies. God the son dies in his human flesh. And he is well and truly buried. Truly buried. You know, that's wonderful news because you don't ever have to worry about going to the grave alone. He's gone there with you already. That's good news, isn't it? And then he's raised on the third day Paul says, for our justification, and then he is ascended into heaven, still in bodily form, still bearing the scars. That's why he says to Thomas the doubter, come after the resurrection, come here and see my hands, see my side, it's really me. And then he ascends into heaven as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world where he is standing right now representing you, praying for you, overseeing, overruling everything in your life. Now, why are you worrying? See, we worry because we forget that story, don't we? Listen, that's the good news. That's the gospel, and you need the gospel when you are seeking to fight your worry. Remember what he's done. How do I know, God, that you'll take care of me? A uh, Calvary. Right? How do I know? How do I know? So what does the gospel tell us about God's ability and willingness to care for us and provide for us? Paul says in Romans 8, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? I don't care who's against you. It could be Iran. It could be the Russians. It could be space aliens. If God's for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son. See, Paul's reminding them of the gospel. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Whatever you need, he will give to you. So then by faith, we continually reflect on all he's already done for us, and our faith will grow. Don't look at your own faith and, and try to figure out whether or not it's growing. Look at him. Look at what he's done. He had perfect faith in your place. Trust him. If he was willing to do all this to meet my deepest need, which is forgiveness, which is salvation, won't he also be able to provide all I need in this sad world? Nothing, not death, nor life, nor any created thing can separate us from God's love for us in Jesus. Nothing, listen to me, nothing, nothing you can imagine in all of the universe, in all of creation will be able to separate you from that strong love of God your Father for you. You don't need to worry. He's got it. He's got it. So then, very, very quickly, don't be anxious about your life. 
Don't anxiously question God's ability or desire to provide for you. Don't seek your own kingdom or your own righteousness. You can attack unbelief, worry, and anxiety in faith, believing that you can war against these things because your Savior has already been tempted in these ways and has won the victory. He has won the victory in your place. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Don't worry. We don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Not somebody who's way off over there and always has everything he wants and never has any problems. He's bearing your flesh. He knows what it's like. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin, let us then put off worry and with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may find mercy and that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You fall on your face or in the middle of the night you say, God, I need you, here I am again. And he doesn't get angry and say, what's wrong with you? See, he knows what's wrong with you. That's why he sent his son. I'm going to go down now to the passage in Philippians 4, 5 through 9. The Lord is at hand. Where is the Lord? Right, right here. Here. The Lord is at hand. He's here. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. God, help! Here I am again. Please help me. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then finally, control what you think about. This is basically what he's saying. Whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. All of those words describe Jesus Christ in the gospel. Think about what he's done. And now I'm going to leave you with one more quote from the Heidelberg Catechism, talking about the word providence. What, what is providence? Providence is the almighty and ever-present power of God. It's almighty and it's ever-present power of God by, with, by which he upholds as with his hand heaven and earth and all creatures and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, Food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things, in fact, come to us not by chance. There is no such thing as chance. Do you understand? See, that's what faith tells us. There is no such thing as chance. Chance is just the way that the world wants to talk about what happens because they want to ignore the fact that there is a God. There is no such thing as luck. No luck, no chance. Just providence. And that's better, right? Because we have a heavenly Father who loves us. All things, in fact, come to us not by chance, but from his loving, fatherly hand. Who, this hand, that hand was willing to afflict his son in your place so that he could always bring you to himself and care for you. That hand. You're in his hand tonight. You are in if you are Christ, if you have believed this message, you are in his hand tonight and nothing comes into your life 
except it comes from his hand. Not chance, not some big bad boogeyman, not whatever it is you're afraid of, none of that. Everything comes to us from his loving hand, and we can trust him. Let me pray for you now. Father in heaven, I thank you. I thank you that you have given us so many beautiful proofs of your love for us. Grant us, God, please, faith to believe that you love us like this and that we can throw ourselves on you and free fall into your mercy. I pray, Father, that you would grant us the grace and faith to do that now. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.